called me to order at 6.03 p.m. on Wednesday, the 13th of October. Um, first order of business is the minutes from the last meeting. Anyone have a beef with any of the uh, notes? Look good to me. I move to we approve the minutes. minutes. No, second. A second. Okay. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me? Yep. Uh, I need to, why did I lose, hold on, for some reason I lost my agenda here, so I got to call, I apologize, I got to call it up again. Warrants. Yeah, no, I just, I, I like to have it in front of me, Fred. Um, okay, warrants, anybody got an issue? Nope. Uh, we do not need to vote on that then, so we're good on that end. Brian, what do we got? Every public time public public comment. Away, I'm, I'm having an issue here with oh. um with the agenda. So I'm I'm running blind on the agenda because every time I click okay. on it, it goes away. No. Public Next comment. One is public comment. Public comments. Anybody? On for those things not listed on the agenda already. Public comments not listed on the agenda. Hearing none, we will move on to the next item. Which is a uh, appointment for Jim. Jimmy Savini, Chief, what, what do you got? Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I, back in September, I submitted um, back in September, I submitted a letter just kind of outlining the training portion of the police reform requirements that we have. Just wanted to kind of give you guys an update. Not sure if you had a chance to, to review it or not, <clears throat> um, but it's a, there's a couple pages with a, an outline of the cost associated with the training and kind of a brief history behind um, why we're doing this training. So I'm not sure if you want me to to go over that or if you just want to come up with any questions or how do you want to do this? If, if you've got something that you think um, is especially um, salient to our conversation or things that we should, we, you feel we should highlight, feel free. Um, well, I guess I could just give a brief overview of just so everybody's kind of on the same page as far as as far as what we're doing, because we're we're getting ready to start the start the training for. Our, we only have one officer in the first group. Um, so back in December of uh, 2020, December 31st, the governor signed a bill. We we're calling it the police reform bill. <clears throat> um, in addition to numerous other things in the bill, there was a training portion of that. So. For police officers training, there's a full-time academy and there's a part-time academy, which was called the Reserve Intermittent Academy. So the Reserve Intermittent Academy no longer exists as of July 1st of this year. Um, that's it's gone. There's there's no more part-time academy, um, and technically there's no more part-time officers. So everybody in Massachusetts is going to be certified at one standard. Um, that one standard is, is going to be the same across the board, whether you're part-time, full-time, it, it doesn't matter. Um, they realize the legislators and our municipal police training committee realize that they didn't get the same level. Part-time officers didn't get the same level of training as a full-time officer. Uh, they got about half the amount of hours, and then we had to spend much more time with them after they got out of the academy uh, from a field training perspective. So what they did is they came up with what they're referring to as the Bridge Academy. It's, um, it's going to be some training that's designed to bridge the training hours, to bridge the hours between a part-time officer and a full-time officer. 
So they made a determination that that, that training should be 200 hours. Um, 120 hours of that training is in person and 80 hours of that training is online. So there's, I've got a list of a bunch of different classes that they're gonna be doing online, two hour, four hour blocks um, with, with the officers. And the in-person training is, they have to undergo 40 hours of firearms training. They have to undergo 40 hours of emergency vehicle operation and control training. And they have to undergo 40 hours of defensive tactics training. Um, most of which they've already had, but not at the same level again as the full-time academy. So, um, so they're making them run through the full, full curriculum. Um, so what that does for, for our town or our department, which is when we look back at the budget season, um, I requested additional funds for training to be able to pay for any training, any equipment, any uh, software for computers that we might need to accomplish this training. Um, so technically, July 1st is when the training started. They don't have classes posted as of yet, <laughs> so, so we're still working on it. So our first officer has to have this training completed by June 30th of 2022. So it looks like he's going to have about seven or eight months to do that. Um, so they split the alphabet up into thirds. The first group, the A through H group is going this year. The next group goes next year. And then the third group goes the, the third year. Um, it looks like we've got six officers that we're going to have to uh, put through this training in order to keep them employed as part-time officers for our department. Um, the issue further down the road may come up that once these officers are certified, they're certified as a police officer. So there is no difference between full-time and part-time certification. They could then take a job somewhere else from a full-time position without having to attend a full-time academy. So there's a potential that we could lose some of our officers um, within the next three to five years. And <clears throat> as far as I know, talking just general conversation with our officers. We've got a definite three people that don't really have an interest in um, moving on and going to a, a different department. They're happy in Waitley. They'd like to stay in Waitley. Um, if we end up with those three people, the, the issue could come up with the number of shifts that we have to cover um, that would put them working too many hours as non-benefited employees. So we may have to address that further down the road as well. But the more immediate concern is the training itself, that 200 hours of training. So just to break down the numbers a little bit, um, and things are, things are still changing with this, the Human Resources Division of the, for the state, um, they're the ones that run the physical assessment tests for pre-employment for police officers. Each officer has to pass a a physical assessment test. I'm not sure if nobody from the state addressed this with them <laughs> before it came up, but we recently got an email recently, as in the beginning of this week, got an email from the human resource division that basically said, I'm sorry, but we can't, we can't test all of the people that you want us to test. It's, it's not possible. We don't have the facilities. We don't have the, the instructors. We don't have the, the people to do it. So they just voted yesterday, the Municipal Police Tr Training Committee voted yesterday to uh, do away with that requirement for the physical assessment test. So the only requirements that we have for our part-time officers to attend the training, um, they have to have a pre-employment physical, which they've already had one for the town, but they have to have another one, which is more lengthy and depth. There's an eight page um, doctor's report that has to be submitted signed off by their doctor. So they have to have that medical examination. Um, and then <clears throat> there was a couple other things, the PAT being one of them. There was also talk of a psychological evaluation. That's gonna be for brand new hires. So the officers that we already have, we don't have to do that with them. We don't have to run them through a psychological evaluation. So really what we're down to is the physical, um, the pre-employment physical. So we have one officer that's scheduled for his physical next week. Once he completes his physical, 
um, and has the documentation from his doctor, then he can start signing up for classes, um, the in-person classes that aren't really even posted yet. <laughs> so, um, so we're working on some regional training for Franklin County because the training that they do have, it looks like the majority of it's going to be in Devon's Mass. So um, officers are going to have to drive out to Devon's for 120 hours of additional training. Um, it's it's going to be a, a difficult thing for a lot of the officers to do because they, they have full-time jobs during, during the day. So we're working on some regional training. Um, I've recently been made the area representative for Franklin County for firearms. So I'm in the process of compiling all of our instructors for Franklin County. We've got about 30, 30 to 40 people for the first group that has to go through for the Bridge Academy for firearms for that 40 hours. We're going to try to do that in Franklin County somewhere. Um, we're going to have a meeting soon with the, with our instructors just to, to see where, where we have ranges that might be available and what we have for instructors that can um, offer up their, their time um, to teach these these classes as well. So um, that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, moving forward for this this year, our, our, our officer has to attend the 40 hours of the emergency vehicle operation and control training. And they also have to do defensive tactics training. The only other issue is with the EVOC training, what we, what we call the EVOC training, um, that's out in Devons. So there's gonna be a, a cost associated with that for fuel, wear and tear on the cruiser. We're gonna use the sedan that we have. It's, um, we're kind of in the process of going through it to make sure that it's gonna be safe enough to, to take that class, to, to go through the punishment of that class. Um, but ultimately if that car breaks, at least we're not down a frontline cruiser. So it's, that's kind of why I'm looking to, to use that car. So if something does happen to it and we have to bring it back, back on a flatbed, we're not out of a patrol car. So that's, that's kind of my, my current plan for that. Um, just take a quick look to make sure I didn't miss anything. Sounds, sounds pretty comprehensive. Oh. Anybody have any questions again? I think that's Yeah, well, one Is quick question. question. Sure. Where do the, we've got six, part-time people, where do they figure to be in the three-year cycle? Do we, you know, two per year or where do their names so fall? We have one for the first year. Um, one for the first year, two for the second year, three for the third year. Okay. That's, so that's one, good because we're less likely to lose. We've got, if, if we're going to lose people, I'd rather have it later rather than sooner. Correct. Yeah. So we're, I mean, I think we'll be, will probably be good for the the three years. Our first year person that's going has he has no interest in in taking a full time job anywhere else. He he does um, sales. He travels. He's his full time job. Um, so he he's not looking for a full time job in law enforcement. Um, he's happy with staying in Waitley. So at least for the next the next year, we're not going to really have any issues with any of our officers just leaving and going somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, it's an investment. It's it's a what did I come up with for? We're gonna we're gonna end up taking off the cost for the PAT <clears throat> training because um, mm -hmm. we don't have to do that now. So we're we're looking right in the five thousand dollar range for just over five thousand dollars for training each officer mm -hmm. to go through this training. So. So it is a, it is an investment from the from the town's perspective. Yeah, we've we've uh, allocated fifteen thousand per year for the next three years. So we're correct. Well in under that. Yep. Yep. And the first year, um, even though we will have one officer, the first year uh, we have some software, and we're the software is related to our our body cams. So we we're going to have to purchase software for editing um, our body cams, the footage. Um, for public records requests and things like that. Um, so we have to be able to, to redact information and, and be able to edit those um, videos. 
to protect people's privacy and things like that. Um, but that that software is about five thousand dollars just for the software. So that's why the first year we only have one officer, but we have the software and some some equipment and additional ammunition that we we have to purchase as well. So I'm looking to to get some of that stuff under the first year's budget. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. you had a question um yeah um and it, it, i guess it's um well one was the same as fred's are, are, are our officers evenly distributed alphabetically uh but if you've already answered that the other one was you said six part-time officers is that all of our part-time officers when you said six or is that just the six who are not also full-time officers elsewhere correct so they'd be getting their training at their sort of their their full-time police job correct yeah, so any make, any full any current full-time officer doesn't have to attend any additional training and it doesn't matter if they're because we have really we just have two full-time officers and the rest are part-time and six seem like too small a number yeah so uh, the, the so officers that our, we have one of them okay. is going to be going for another department and the other ones have uh, they already have full-time certification they've already been yeah. to the full-time academy so they don't, okay. they don't have to attend the bridge training so we only have six people that have to have to attend the, the training. Uh, yeah, I just want I wanted to double check because that was my understanding is that a, a number of our part time officers are full time elsewhere, and they're just picking up an extra shift. And I wanted to make sure I understood that that the six was the remainder. Correct. And that sounds like that I understood that correctly. Thanks. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, good recap. Any any other questions before we let. Uh, Jim uh, bid adieu. Jonathan, I just have a, a quick question. Yes. Just to just for clarification. So so Jim, after the three years, the Bridge Academy goes away, and then everybody's everybody needs to go to the full time academy. Correct. Yeah, there will there will no longer be a reserve intermittent academy or a bridge academy. The bridge academy is only for current part time officers. After those three years, if we hire somebody after those three years, they're gonna have to be full-time academy train. They're going to have to have a physical, the PAT, psychological evaluation. They're going to have to have all of that. And it's going to be difficult to get somebody to commit to that level to only work a couple of couple of shifts a month. So that's right. For, for part-time yeah. hours. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they ultimately want a full-time job somewhere. And they're building then it might be worth it. But we have to right. yeah. cross that bridge, pun intended, when we get to it. <laughs> there we go. When, when we hit that three year mark, Jim, what will be the will, will there be a budget implication for us? Um, no. So the only I mean, the only budget implication moving forward is if we decide um, if we lose officers and we're having trouble um, filling the shifts with the, the officers that we have without going over their hours, then we're going to have to look at either benefiting positions you know, part-time 24 hour a week positions or going with additional full-time positions um, to fill to fill the shifts. So those are the only real implications okay. after the three years. All right. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Jim, thank you so much for the update. Appreciate it. Sure. A lot. Yeah, no, there'll, there'll definitely be more because the, um, the legislation that came down for the police reform is pretty i think it's right now it's like 146 pages so there's a lot of stuff to it um defensive tactics use of force body cams um the handling complaints for officers there's a lot of components to it so i think we we're going to have more discussions uh, moving forward down the road so okay great thank you thank you for your time thank you all right, all right brian town buildings and other protective covid19 measures Right. So this was a this was an agenda item that that we wanted to keep revisiting um, in terms of the status of uptown buildings. I included in your packet an email from from Fran, uh, Fran Fortino in terms of the board, the Board of Health recommendation for town building use. Um, and the recommendation to the board is that. Um, because the COVID situation um, is improving that they recommend the Waitley Town Hall may be open for use for in-person events and meetings provided room capacity is limited to 50%. Um, they talked about air purification in place, which is which we do have in place there. Face coverings would be required, uh, social distancing required by individuals and households, 
attendance log for contact tracing. Um, they didn't say this, but I, I, it's, I think, common sense that anybody who's sick with COVID-19 symptoms or not sick should come inside the building. Um, so they had those recommendations. And they also made a comment about um, participants, participants must be masked, socially distanced, except for single household groups and fully vaccinated. Medical exemptions are allowed. Um, so that is their recommendation. Um, I'm per, I guess I'm not comfortable, or I think we should discuss the, the recommendation that, that people be fully vaccinated before entering public buildings, because I think that's a little problematic. Um, but that is the recommendation that they had sent. Um, why do you feel it's problematic? Um, I think it's problematic from from an enforcement uh, from an enforcement point of view, um, because we don't we definitely don't have the resources for for town staff to check the vaccination status of people that are entering buildings. Um, Plus, once once they're in the building, they're in. Right. So I, maybe I can ask a, a little more about what the the root of the concern is. We certainly don't have the resources to like send a police officer to check people for vaccine status and enforce <coughs> masks and make people show proof of exemption and that sort of thing. So that's not what I'm what I'm getting to. But you know, given that we don't have that, is the um, is the concern that if we like at least on paper, say we're going to require it and then we don't provide the resources to enforce it, that we might be in trouble, uh, you know, should someone get ill or sick, is that gonna maybe fall on um, on the town for responsibility? Um, like like what, what exactly is our risk if we tell them, if we say, hey, we're requiring that you be vaccinated for these in-person meetings. We offer a remote option, certainly for all of our public meetings. Um, and we don't have the resources to enforce it. So you might sneak and get away with it, but um, do, do we, uh, am I missing like some legal liability that we might have uh, were someone to, uh, you know, flout that regulation and then later turn up that somebody gets sick, whether it's the person who didn't follow the rules or the person who did. Um, we're not saying that people without vaccines don't need masks. We're saying everybody needs masks, whether you're vaccinated or not, but that if you're gonna be in person, we're making, you know, the, the, what I'm reading from the Board of Health is that they would say, yeah, um, we, if you're gonna be in person, you need to be vaccinated and masked, right? And you're saying that's hard to that's hard to enforce. So we should just drop the part about vaccinated and really stick with the masks and the social distancing. Um, so I don't know if I've made that more clear, more muddy. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if it's a liability issue. Do you think, or just um, oh, we we don't want to even you know pretend that we're putting resources toward this? Um, I, I, I wasn't thinking about the liability aspect of it. Um, I think that would be a difficult, I think that would be a difficult case to make in terms of showing liability. Um, but and I don't, I don't know that, that there would be a, a a case for negligence. I, I wouldn't think so, but obviously you could make, you could, you could try to make one. Um, I, I mean, I guess, I, I guess to the extent that it's, I, I guess my thinking was that it's, it's a really polarizing issue. Um, and do we do, do we do more harm by, by putting this requirement in place without the resources to enforce it? Um, 
because because it is such a polarizing issue. But mm-hmm. I, I I can yeah. I, listen. I I can see the other side too because I was thinking about it earlier, and I mean I think if you think about it as a according to the the data and statistics as I understand them. If you had a room of vaccinated people and you had a room of unvaccinated people, the room of vaccinated people would be less likely um, to have somebody that, that that's sick with COVID-19. I don't know if I'm understanding that correctly. Um, Joyce, you understand t- statistics better than me. <laughs> um, so by having everybody vaccinated, then presumably it's a safer, it's a safer event. If I can, I, I would love to see everyone vaccinated, but I think it sets a bad precedent for us to issue a regulation that we either have don't have the intention or the ability to enforce. I just don't think that's good yeah. practice. Uh, yeah, and, and I, th- th- this meeting will be public record with us saying we can't enforce. It. Uh, right. So to to then say, well, we're going to do it anyway and to scare people or whatever. I just think it's bad, yeah. bad policy. No, I, well, I was I was thinking, well, I sort of have two minds and, and I'm, like the harm that Brian refers to might be the harm of, and let me pick on D since she's here, that, you know, D who maybe who is vaccinated and goes to an event and sees somebody that she knows isn't vaccinated. It's like they're flat, they're getting away with this, this, you know, flouting the rules. And, um, and that's kind of the harm. That's the kind of people not really um, being able to have any kind of confidence in, um, you know, the, the basic public safety. Although with masks still required, that harm would be, uh, you know, the physical chance of transmission kind of harm is, is smaller. So I'm thinking mostly the, the, the harm is in the, well, let's make a rule that people don't have to follow if we don't catch them. Um, and that, I think that mostly applies to public meetings because I think it is, like Brian mentioned, I think in one of these emails that it is a little problematic to exclude people from a public meeting um, because they're not vaccinated. Um, but I was also thinking about the um, the people who want to rent the town hall for the concert. They seem they're perfectly willing to require people to show their vaccine cards and do that particular policing for us. So I didn't want to say that, oh, you can't do that or you don't have to do that. I, I think I would say, you know, we I, I don't mind as much, I guess, as Fred and Brian of putting in something in, you know, make the rule that you need to be vaccinated to be in person, make the remote option available for people who either can't or won't get vaccinated and let the people running the event be the ones who do the enforcement and the event, if it's, you know, if it's the, if it's a commission meeting, then um, the commissioners know each other, you know, if it's the ag commission, they all know each other. Um, you know, the, it, it can be on the committee to do that uh, particular job. Um, yeah. and, and we know it won't, it won't be a perfect job of enforcement either, but I'm, I'm not inclined to do to ask for less than the board of health has asked for. I think I would, I would agree with Joyce in that, you know, and I think everybody at some level that the only way that we implement what the board of health has recommended is if we actually come up with an enforcement mechanism, which we're not prepared to do right now. We don't have the capacity, we don't have means, what have you. Um, so I, I, I think that the mask mandate is appropriate, um, and but I also think that we can strongly encourage vaccinations. Um, I know if I were running a meeting, I would I would be have no problem saying. And, and by the way, it's it's not about your health, unvaccinated people. It's about the health of the person next to you, and that you have a like more likely um, possibility of spreading COVID to the person next to you without you being vaccinated. And that's just data. Um, And I would have no problem saying that in a meeting in terms of public pressure, but it can't be enforced. Um, And I am with Joyce in terms of if if somebody renting out town hall 
or somewhere else wanted to enforce a, a, a vaccination mandate, hey, that's up to them. It's not. It's not a. It's not a town function. It's a private function. And I think they're there. It's, it's apples and oranges in, in terms of that comparison. So I. No, I, I I totally agree with that. If it's a private function, they can do what they want. But it's question what we do as far as a requirement or mandate. Mm. You know. That yeah. We're just not in a position to enforce a town. To have a town enforced mandate if private groups want to do that more power to them mm -hmm. yeah i guess that's where i disagree then is that i think that's a little bit about what leadership is about and we may not be able to enforce it perfectly but if we say look this is what we think is needed we need you to not be here in person if you're not vaccinated then I think that's that's where the bar is. And it might be that within a few months, the rates are low enough that we decide otherwise. So I, I may get voted down here, but- And I, I think our, my only difference is on one word that you say, we need you to be max vaccinated. And I would say, we want you. We strongly want you to be vaccinated. But that's not what the Board of Health is saying. The Board of Health's recommendation, and this is in our packet, um, says their recommendation is that participants must be masked, socially distanced, except for single household groups, and fully vaccinated. Okay, that's what the Board of Health was recommending. They said medical exemptions are allowed. And I presume that refers to both the masking and the vaccination. And then the event or meeting coordinators are responsible to assure these precautions are enforced to keep the list of attendees. And should there need be a need to contact trace, um, then this recommendation might be rescinded if, if conditions change. So I, I am just because it's, you know, I'm not the event coordinator. So I, I think it's okay to put that onus on an event or meeting coordinators plate. I'm just not and, sure. And I know I can't, I, they might they might not be in a great position to enforce it either. They may then decide that their meeting's gonna be held remotely then. But I don't feel like I wanna override the Board of Health's recommendation. Well, I, I'm, I I'm looking at the note that Fran sent to Brian just before this meeting where Brian asked, uh, how about town offices reopen for meetings with masks and social distancing? And Fran responded, I think the Board of Health would be okay with that and some capacity limits. Right. So that's, that's his opinion on what they might do is what that email says. The actual recommendation of the Board of Health is what's in the packet. And then, so when he says maybe some capacity limits, well, there was already capacity limits in their recommendation. I assume that means additional capacity limits. Um, I don't know what those are. I mean, if he wants to, to amend this, we're going to meet again in two weeks. We could do it then. But I, I, I personally, I mean, and I may get voted down. You guys, I mean, it's why, it's why there's three people on the board. So we don't have a lot of ties. Um, I think I would stick with their original and let the person organizing the meeting have the, the duty to, to do whatever enforcement is necessary. And I think in most cases, there will be very little enforcement needed. So, well, let me ask, we need to A, define a meeting, but also B, I'm not convinced that everyone carries around their vaccination card or a picture of their vaccination they, card. Well, they should. Well, but 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 should and do, do are obviously two different things. Does anybody in this meeting not carry their vaccine card with them or a picture of it? I, I, again, it should and actually do are two different things. And you know, when when we put this in as our policy, then people know they have to. You know, so, so Joyce, you're saying. And I'm, I'm not making a judgment. I'm just making sure we're clear. Yeah. You're saying that if, if, if there's a meeting held and, it, and yep. the meeting could be a committee meeting, it also could be a meeting that 
the principal at the elementary school convenes among people, six people in her conference room, which is a public meeting no. in a public building. That's our, that, we don't have control over that meeting. We have control over the board's meeting in our town buildings. But, but, but it's a meeting in a public building. So I think that um, would, I, I think that would fall under those guidelines, but regardless, so you're saying- no, we, Well, I don't think we control the school. School would have a policy on that and not us. Well, but there's many public meetings. The planning board wants to meet. Let's use the planning board. Planning board wants to meet. That's clearly a public meeting that's under our jurisdiction. And that person, if somebody does not, not have a card, I think it's an awful lot to ask a volunteer to say, you have to leave this meeting. Thank you very much. We appreciate your interest, but you have to leave this meeting. And it's not just committee members, it's the general public who want to, who want to, to, um, to come and watch. I think that's why we have remote access and it's but, so easy to do with a phone. You can participate in that meeting without being in the room. I, I, I agree, but if somebody were to show up, I think I, I'm hard pressed. I, I think you give them a phone. And then, you know, we, we do this all the time. Like if something comes up and a meeting gets, there's all kinds of things that could come up in a public meeting. But, you know, it's just, it's the best we can do. It's not going to be perfect. We're, we're going to be, we're going to be confronting this when um, rec basketball starts, you know, in a few weeks. Are we going to, ask parents to show their vaccination card if they're going to watch their child practice are we going to ask that's the not under our policy? jurisdiction that's that? not what this committee is in is in charge of oh of we're in charge of meetings at the town offices and at the town hall that's okay. we're not in charge of meetings at the school the school will have a policy for that but the, right but because your the sports meetings are at the school right we don't get to set the policy for the school. That's why we have a school committee. School committee gets to set that policy. I, I think it's a big gray area. I think it's a big gray area. Yeah. Well, uh, we may have discussed it as much as we're gonna and come to an agreement as much as we're going to. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and move that we go with the, uh, the Board of Health's, you know, written, confirmed recommendation from October 12th, um, which does include uh, participants being fully vaccinated if they're going to be in person. Just as a reminder, we have as our policy that uh, all public meetings have to also have a remote option uh, for, uh, for participation. I move that we go with that. And if it doesn't get a second, then I think somebody else has got to move something else. I'm, I'm going to ask a question first. What happens if the meeting organizer does not seek verification? And they're falling down on the job. Um, well, I, I don't have any control over that. But it would be their responsibility. Until this policy is changed. Do I hear a second? Hearing no second, um, the, the conversation needs to continue about what we do to amend this, um, the, the, the suggestion from the Board of Health. And I, I would move that we substitute the word strongly urge to require or require in uh, in terms of vaccination. You mean the reverse, don't you, Fred? I, I want strongly urged to be the standard, not require for vaccinations. Right, strong, strongly or for attendance right. in public buildings. Yeah. Okay, for the record, that's meaningless. I mean, it basically there's there's no meaning to strongly urge. It's the same thing as you don't have to. Right. So. And, but if we can't enforce something, that's meaningless too. Right. 
Yeah. But I think, I, I think it is a different meaning. I think it sends a different message. Um, I would go further and ask that organizers of meetings, chairs, say, if you are not vaccinated, we encourage you to leave the meeting. I'm fine with that. So I'm fine with anything that goes right up to the line of before require. Right. Right. Um, and if and if committee chairs aren't comfortable saying that, then committee and, and we can enforce this, I think. If committee chairs are not comfortable using that language to open a meeting, then we will. I think we can require committee chairs to hold the meeting completely virtually. I'm fine with that. Um, so is that your motion, Fred? Yes, as amended. I, I, I would second that. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? No. Me, yes. Uh, records show that it's two to one and it does pass. And just so now that it's voted on, is our, have we been clear enough so that the notes can reflect and, and policy can be ref, can reflect the board's intent? Well, so let me recap then, if you, if you give me a second. Yeah. Um, reopen town hall and town offices for both um, in-person, private and public meetings, 50% um, capacity, uh, face coverings required, social distancing required for individuals or household units, um, attendance log kept for um, public meetings, hybrid meetings are required um, via Zoom and um, strongly urge uh, vaccinations and um, you want the, the chairperson or the event organizer to make a statement that unvaccinated persons are strongly encouraged to not stay? Well, I think it's, personally, I think it's twofold. I think the meeting announcement has to be direct and say that um, we ask that non-vaccinated people not attend the public meeting. And then at, mm -hmm. the, at, the, at the hearing, the meeting, whatever it's called, um, the, the, the organizer of the chair um, ask that those vac not vaccinated um, Please not stay, stay for the meeting. Brian, did you say event planners and chair people? I thought we were just talking about chairs of meetings, not event coordinators. Um, it's going to apply to public and private meetings, correct? Public and private meetings, <clears throat> but not events? And events. Events are. And events? Sort of. Yeah. yeah, and well, and, and and the private event, if if someone wants to require vaccination cards, that is fully within their scope. The the question, yeah, and 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 I guess I was using chairs and organizers, um, and and I'll and I'll use the grain just my example. I don't know if there's a chair or there's a what have you, but but I can envision. Um, or, or no, let's not use the grain. Let's use the the historical society. Um, that's a, that's a, that's, if, if you have five people meeting at the historical society, there may not be a chair present. They may be meeting to plan, to organize, what have you. Um, and we should, and that person who organized the meeting needs to be very clear about both the invitation. And once they get there, if you're not vaccinated, um, we strongly encourage you to use Fred's language, um, that, that you not stay for this meeting. So that's why I used event organizer and community chairs, committee chairs. Although, Amy, I, I think that um, that the chair is going to be usually the, the term that is most often used 
for for the purposes of, of, of this because that's what meetings exist in a, in a public building. But again, I, I would I would I would strongly and, and I maybe I have my head in the sand, but I, I I have never understood any reason why someone wouldn't get a vaccine. So it, it just it, it I yeah. don't understand it. Um, you get polio vaccine, yeah. you get mumps and measles and rubella, you get all these vaccines. And people don't think twice about it. I speak now. Absolutely. Uh, the reason I'm sitting in here is that we have a Grange meeting. Our Grange meeting always follows your select board meeting. A month ago, you closed the town hall. We had to make quick decisions and moved to the church. We prefer not to move to the church if possible. So if I understand correctly, um, our president or master could say what you've already said, which I can, can report to her. Um, and we would certainly not have the 50% capacity or excess. So I'm hoping from what I'm gleaning tonight that we could hold the Grange meeting upstairs, which we have um, had reserved for us and make the statement that if anyone has not been vaccinated, they would be asked to leave. Am I correct? I mean, I, or do I need to go to the church? I, I think that's accurate. I think Brian will distribute the actual steps to be taken to all committees and to organizations like the Grange, at, you know, post haste. But I think you're spot on, Adelia. Yeah. As far as I understand it, you're right. You you can have your meeting at the town hall. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to get I, my I'm going to get my 70 year membership, and I I joined in the town hall, and I'd like to get it at the town hall and not go to the church. I don't blame you. Um, the, the other thing that I, I want to make sure that we are just reminding, remindful of, um, this policy, though it goes into effect, I assume, right now, um, it is not for meetings that, let's say there's a meeting that's posted for tomorrow to be a Zoom. It still has to be a Zoom. This does not allow some, a, a group to meet suddenly in person because of posting requirements. So it's it's for those meetings to be posted starting tomorrow morning and going forward. And organize for those that require notice. The Grange meeting doesn't require notice. Well, yeah, that's what I was saying. It, it, you know, it, when, when invitations go out from here forward, right? Okay. I, I've got one question with just with regard to town boards and commissions. How do we stand? as far as an ability to hold hybrid meetings at town offices now? Or are we still fully on Zoom for our meetings and planning and zoning, et cetera? Um, so, so we're still with the, with, we're still with sort of the two laptop setup if we were gonna do that. Um, we're still waiting on some of the equipment I think that we ordered from Wasp is on back order. Um, so we have the, I mean, we have a, it would essentially be a, a two laptop setup. So we've done it before um, and it's possible. It's not ideal, but it's possible. As, as, as the, the chair, I would say that if it were up to me unilaterally, this board would continue to meet via Zoom and only via Zoom for the foreseeable future to avoid all the pitfalls that we've discussed in this meeting right now. <laughs> So oh, I'm I'm good with that. Okay, just just wanted to check it out. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate that, Fred. But it's um, you know I, I I think this format works works great. Admittedly, a lot of people are zoomed out, and I and I'd love to be in person, etc. But um, um, I I I see no reason to to change how we meet as as a board. Uh, in the in the immediate future. Um, okay, we'll move on then. Thank you for that for that great conversation, everybody. Um,
uh, discuss and vote to issue a bond anticipation note in, in the amount of $220,000 to Greenfield Cooperative Bank for the pumping station to be constructed off of Chestnut Plain Road. What's this, Brian? Right, so this is the, the borrowing for the construction of the pumping station to facilitate the merger of the water district with the water department. Uh, town meeting, uh, two annual town meetings ago, I think it was, uh, authorized the issuance of $220,000 in debt. Um, so now we, now was the time that we needed it. So it was put out for, uh, for low bid. And the low bidder was Greenfield Cooperative Bank, at interest rate of 0 0.350. Um, and this is a one-year note. So it would require the, the approval of the board. Terms. What's that? Those are pretty good terms. And the yeah. anticipation is that this will be repaid out of hookup fees that uh, the water board will collect. Yeah, correct. Or, or all the, within that first year period, presumably. Or, or, or through means that have been set up to help people who um, need financial assistance as part of that. I'm, I'm just trying to establish that we're <clears throat> we're looking to get full reimbursement for all except the 0.35% interest within the year. That would be the goal. That, that, that would, that's the terms under which we got the loan uh, past the town meeting in the first place. Yes. Okay. Do I hear a motion? Move we accept the loan as proposed. Second. I'll second. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me? Yes. Unanimous. Um, discuss and vote to accept an emergency management performance grant of $2,700. Brian? So this is a grant that, it's an annual grant that Lynn submits every year as the emergency management director. Um, this grant um, is was awarded for $2,700. Um, and it's to purchase one of the new radios that the town is switching to. As you, you might recall, the town is switching from the, uh, the public safety radio system operated by the FERCOG and it's switching to the, the system operated by the Mass State Police. Um, and in the uh, radio <laughs> count that was submitted for the fire and police department, um, no one included a radio for the emergency management director. So um, there was an opportunity to submit uh, this grant for those costs. Okay. Uh, do I hear a motion? Um, I move that we accept this grant. Second. Second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. Unanimous to discuss whether to adopt a fee for the change alterations of alcohol licenses. So this came up. Uh, we had a we had a question from from a licensee who was filing a change of officers for their um, alcohol license, and it came up as to whether there there is a local fee. Uh, some communities charge sort of a a flat sort of administrative fee for uh, amendments to alcohol licenses. Some don't, um, and as far as I can tell, that the town has not um, does not have a um, a fee for this um, change of license. And the, I guess the question is whether we should adopt one or not. Um, the ones that I've seen, I think are, are, are somewhere in the range of like $50, 25 to $50. Um, the licensee does pay a, pay a $200 fee to the ABCC, but that obviously doesn't come to the town. Um, so it's, I mean, when they apply, there are some administrative tasks that that are undertaken. Um, so the question is whether we want to whether, whether we want to recoup uh, recoup those costs or not from the applicant. Personally, I think if it's time taken by the by by a staff person that we should recoup costs. Joyce, you were mm -hmm. going to say, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, um, no, I was thinking along the same lines. Do we know what other towns charge for that? Probably not $200 like the ABCC. Uh, 
the the ones that I have seen were between 25 and 50, I think with 50 being the most common. So that would be about two hours of, of staff time. Yeah. Um, and most of these require advertising and um, a public hearing before the board and those types of things. So it's probably about, it's probably about right in terms of the, the amount. Hmm. Okay. I, I think $50 is very, very reasonable personally. It's the cost of doing business. Yeah, let's see if it's costing us staff time, money to right. do it, we should recoup it. We should be accounting for, for what it costs to, to, to run a town. Um, no different than a business would. Yeah, and, and I guess the other question I was thinking of was typically this is the um, the convenience store up at exit 35 that has sort of the revolving door on who is uh, holding the license because they keep changing managers. Um, so I I, yeah. I would move that we um, establish that fee at uh, $50 and put it on this same list of fees we evaluate every so often. I'll second that. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Yes. Me, yes. Okay, unanimous. Um, and <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to do this, but before Brian gets into his town administrator updates, I am going to, um, not for the purposes of just events that a private group would um, would host in a public building, but I'm going to, I want to revisit... Um, the public meeting thing for a second in terms of vaccines. And I just thought about it as we were sitting here. Obviously there's no perfect solution to this as we've all agreed that there are challenges inherent in every st uh, step we potentially take. Because of those, why don't we just keep mandated Zoom meetings for public meetings for the foreseeable future and not open up this kettle of fish. That would, that would make the, whether you're vaccinated completely moot for the foreseeable future, except for, you know, people who are doing town business. But if we want to avoid this, why not just keep Zoom meetings as our modus operandi for the, for the foreseeable future? I've got no problem with that myself. Um, would we then have people at events required to show vaccines and put the uh, onus for um, for enforcing that on the event organizers since it would not be a volunteers trying to run a board? Um, I, 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 at first blush, Joyce, I would agree with that because it's their choice as to whether they want to hold a meeting. That being said, I, I hesitate to change course on that because of the direction we just gave D in terms of a Grange meeting. I, I think I would um, rather- The Grange is, Grange is, a, is not a, you know, a public posted meeting. I, 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 get, I get that. I'm just saying that we told D one thing and she left and, and now we're, we're, we're changing what that requirement might be. And I'm just saying that maybe we should, we should take that piece of it and have a subsequent conversation in two weeks at the next board meeting. Um, just so we're not, we're not blindsiding anybody. I think a phone call to D would be a way to be not blindsided, but they, you know, I, I, I have, you know, I, I'm just pressing that I really think it's better if we go with the board of health's actual recommendation that the whole board of health voted on. And I know I already lost that one, Right. Um, you thought of a way to, to kind of get out of the problem of the, you know, the, that you expressed that you don't want to have volunteer board members having to do enforcement on top of all the other volunteer work. And fine, I get that. So it seemed like your objection, your main objection is overcome. So, but you're not really willing to backpedal and then go just basically inform people uh, afterwards. So no, I, I yeah. If 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 the people who had been here originally were were still here, so we could get their feedback, because I think public feedback is always important. 
Um, I think she would, she would, she was just listening and taking in what we were saying. I, I agree with that, but we don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to presume to, 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 to know that I'm right. Well, I'm willing to call her. <laughs> I, I understand that, but I, I would, I would, well, the first step would be, Fred, do you have any objection with, because I, I, I don't, to, 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 to make sure that we don't have this issue, I have no problem maintaining Zoom mandates. I don't either, as long as we continue to revisit it as, because I, I would much prefer in-person meetings as long as we are sure that they are, that we are not threatening anyone's health in any way. And at this point, we're not certain of that, so Zoom meetings continue, but of course, you know, that we continue to address this every two weeks as circumstances change. Then, then I would actually make a motion to, and this doesn't impact what, what I, I would make a motion that we resume Zoom only meetings, unless Brian, you think the, the structure of this has to be different, that we resume, we continue Zoom only public meetings to be checked every two weeks. I'm sure we already have that as a as a selectman. Like, wouldn't we need to rescind and revise that ordinance that we made? That that was my question to Brian about whether I can do what I just did or whether we need to. And that's why I'm looking to him. Uh, I think you would want it. I think you would want to make a motion to reconsider your your previous motion. Okay, I'll make a motion to reconsider um, the the motion that passed two to one. Uh, earlier in this meeting about vaccine mandates and, and, and the order of public business. I will second that. All those in favor, Fred? Aye. Joyce? Aye. Me, yes. <clears throat> now, I would like to make, a, no, now we rescinded it. Now we don't have to do anything, right, Brian? So if you rescinded your, your previous motion, then, then you're going to be where we were before. So town buildings would be closed and town buildings would be closed. Okay. Which is not the same thing as what the Board of Health was recommending. Correct. Right. So, and you know, because it's a, an event that people are willing, are free to do what they, they, what they want to do. And I personally hope that every member of the Grange is actually vaccinated. I would have no problem hearing a motion that would require um, event organizers um, to to have everyone in the meeting demonstrate that they are vaccinated. And but isn't that what isn't that what we just rescinded? Just for events, but this is just for events, Fred. Okay. By events, you mean non-public. Posted non meetings, essentially. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Pri private meetings or other forms of events. Right. For that are not that are not under the color of town sponsors. Exactly. Not things not subject to open meeting law. A, a Grange Historical Society, Watermelon Wednesdays. You know the, the, those types of gatherings. Okay. So, uh, I just want to. I just want to play it out for a second. If I get a call from, I won't use a real board that I'll probably get a call from, but if I get a call from the planning board, for instance, and they say, you're allowing so-and-so private event to meet in person in the town building, but um, we'll use the water commissioners because they're elected. So, and they say, we can't, why can't the water commissioners meet in person in a public building? I'm, I'm, I'm well, not I, sure I, how I would I answer think, that. Yeah, I think because we feel we can't put a vaccine mandate on public servants, but we can on things on for meetings and events that are not required under the law. That's kind of my, I don't know if that's the same word. That that Fred essentially and what we're doing is make it a, a, a term 
of the implied contract for the use of the building by a private group. Right. And and if you and if you and if you don't do as we with as we are asking, then you will lose the right to to use our building in the future because you're in violation of a of a, of a well. Contract. You 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 run the risk of losing the use of the building. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Fine. I'm actually very comfortable with this. I'm I'm comfortable with it too. Okay. Um, so I would make a motion that we implement vaccine mandates for private events in public buildings. And okay, that- can we rephrase it a little bit, John? Because sure. we have an actual written recommendation from the Board of Health regarding masks regarding, um, you know, requiring vaccines, regarding, um, you know, physical distancing and so on. So um, I I guess the way I would put it might be to uh, adopt the recommendation of the Board of Health for uh, non uh, town business related meetings and events in our public buildings. Okay, which means specifically participants must be masked, socially distanced, except for single household groups and fully vaccinated with the medical exemptions allowed. The event or meeting coordinators are responsible to ensure these precautions are enforced. And then uh, if we adopt that for non-town related public meetings, then uh, our town public meetings are still governed by the policy we adopted regarding all meetings will be um, remote, right? And uh, and we look at it every two weeks when we meet. I'll, I'll take that as a motion. Do I hear a second? I will second. All those in favor, Joyce? Aye. Fred? Aye. Me, yes. Now if if I can just add one thing, just to get back to my initial problem with the enforcement. What we're doing here is putting enforcement in the hand of the private group, and they have an enforcement mechanism of exclusion from the group, non-invitation to future events, et cetera, that the town does not have with regard to public meetings. Correct. Correct. So that would leave for public meetings so meetings not covered by the motion that was just made or gatherings what have you um that the public buildings are not available for those people for those boards and committees at this point yes at this point okay i just wanted to i just wanted to at this point town sponsored meetings are not cannot be held in public, they'll be by Zoom, not in person. With, with that to be revisited on a constant basis. I, I think so, yeah. I'm not sure I entirely followed what you said, Fred, but sure. No, I just don't want to. I just want to make sure that we are staying open and on top of this, so that we can get public meetings back into public buildings as soon as possible. Sure, I mean that's always been the yeah that that's right. always been. The case, I just right? want to make that make sure that's on the record that doing this doesn't say we intend to go to Zoom meetings indefinitely. That's all. Okay. Um. All right, now we can go to time answer updates, Brian. All right, everybody's favorite part. Um, special town meeting. So we have a tentative date of November 6th, uh, Saturday, November 6th at 1 p.m. We'll be outside at the town offices, assuming the weather's nice. Um, and I'll be I'll be gathering all the items in, in, and I'll, I'll put together a warrant for the, for the board to review. Um, library accessibility project is out to bid. Again, that's installation of a, of a, a lift and renovations to the, the, the bathrooms downstairs in the library so that uh, everybody will have access to all public spaces in the library regardless of their abilities. 
Um, again, we have the Maya. Um, our insurance company is, is Maya Mass. I'm going to mess it up, but it's our insurance company. Um, it's a risk management grant that's due 11 5. Um, this is usually a workplace safety grant, or um, it's usually a workplace safety grant, or you know, it's improvements to property to reduce the likelihood of loss um, due to whether it's a uh, natural disaster or something like that. Um, community planning grant was awarded to the town. This was $30,000 um, to hire a consultant to do a housing production plan. This is another one of those situations where if we do the planning, then it makes us eligible for future grants. Um, so it's, it's good that we keep leveraging these, leverage, uh, leveraging these types of funds. Um, the other application that we submitted for uh, economic an economic development plan around exit 35 was not funded. Um, Brian, if I can ask a question, the the first, the grant that we got, is that something that you will deal with or is that something that's gonna re get referred to the housing committee? Um, my, so my hope is that it would, it would be worked on by Han uh, Hannah, the new community development administrator with the housing committee. Okay. Um, and we are, and the 30,000 would, would pay for the consultant to work with us. Um, to get that plan done and certified by DHCD. Hey, hey Brian. Um, yep. This is a, a, a non sequitur a little bit, but you mentioned Hannah. I, I think it makes sense to perhaps invite her to the next uh, select board meeting so yep. that we can formally meet her, welcome her, congratulate her on her ascent to this position. Um, and also so that the town can be aware that um, we are active in the 21st century. Sounds good. Uh, thanks for the segue. So speaking of active in the 21st century, the, the town of Whaley has launched its Facebook page. Um, so everybody can go on there and search town of Whaley and, and like the page and follow it. Until, until Facebook gets broken up, you mean? Y yep. Yeah, maybe this isn't a good time to go on Facebook. But anyways, um, So um, let's see, uh, Paytonville Road, 25% uh, design hearing is going to be scheduled probably within the next month, I would, ex I would expect. So this is the, the full depth, well, I think it's still full depth reconstruction of Paytonville Road from uh, the Williamsburg town line to, um, I think it's uh, Strip Road, I believe. Um, the boundaries keep changing a little bit. Um, and if, as a reminder, this is, this is a project that's really beneficial to the town because typically towns pay for design um, and we can get funding through the uh, federal highway funds through the tip. But in this case, mass DOT is paying hundred percent of the design and federal highway funds are paying for hundred percent of the construction. So it's, it's an almost free project. Um, what I've seen so far on the 25% design is there's going to be some, um, some, a little bit of proposed widening. So it, it may take us outside the layout. So we may have to um, uh, pursue some uh, changes in the layout. Um, if there's compensation due, that's the responsibility of the town. Um, there's been some, uh, a lot of the work has been done on the Veterans Memorial. If you have a chance to head up towards the town hall to check that out. Um, I haven't been up there yet, but Keith was telling me that it's it's near completion. Um, Looks I nice. reached. I, yeah, I saw I them working on it. Some from Snow is working on it today. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, as far as I know, the, the the dedication ceremony is still is still uh, planned for Veterans Day, so that's uh, November 11th. I'm, I'm trying to get the time from from Jim Ross as as to when that will be. And obviously, I think if the select board's available, that would be a a, a nice thing to attend. Time of day. And, um, I don't know the time exactly. Keith was guessing that it was one o'clock, but I, I don't know. I'll, I'll confirm that with you. Um, and I don't know if we want to invite any of our state reps or anybody. Oh, another segue. Um, so. I, I would suggest it maybe be at one end or the other of a work day personally. Yeah, I'll talk to the, the, uh, the veterans group. Okay. Um, so speaking of state reps, um, 
yesterday, I think it was yesterday, the 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 state has been working on redistrict uh, redistricting, um, and I had um, reached out to to Natalie and Joe Comerford to to try to get a summary of of, of what was being proposed, um, how it affects Waitley. Um, not so much directly in terms of the house. We'll, Waitley remains in the um, Natalie's district. I would, I don't remember what district that what that is. Um, what's that called? But the second, term, Frank, second Franklin Hampshire, second Franklin Hampshire district. So Waitley remains in that district. In terms of the Senate, um, Waitley will be moved into I th what is I think it's called district. It's district one on the map. It's essentially it's essentially all the towns west of Waitley from from the Vermont, New York, and Connecticut border. Um, originally, we were in, in, in Joe Comerford's district, which included Northampton and, and other communities around us, but now we've, we've been moved, at least proposed to be moved um, into the other district. That district well, is currently- With the caveat that the districts are not owned by the incumbent. Correct. In that state. It's owned by the people. So right. that, just wanted to make sure that gets in there. Now, I haven't, I haven't looked that closely at the Senate district. The four towns of Frontier Regional School District are all in that district or has that been divided? My guess is it may have been divided. For the, for the Senate? Yeah. Yes. They're, divi they're divided. Sunderland is certainly right e east of us. So they're not in, we have, I looked at the map. Waitley is the farthest east now in that district. It sort well, of sticks Deer, out. Deerfield's directly north. So is, which which district is Deerfield in? The other. Deerfield's it, not it, the it, same it, district. Dogs. Yes. Waitley and, jumps I have out. a good argument to make there. I think these are not final maps. They're still looking at them. So that right. might be a really good argument to make. Right. Or, or not, because it means that we have two people looking out for the four towns as opposed to one. I don't know. It depends upon how you look at it. You can make an argument for both. It may also not be easy to find an equivalent size town to swap out along the lines of those districts. Well, I didn't make the map, so I don't know. It might be that was an arbitrary decision. But John's right. It's not necessarily clear whether it matters it matters whether that district elects a responsive person um so so if you zoom in here these are proposed these are the the proposed so waitley and conway would be in yeah so they so, so waitley district yeah. zero one here yeah waitley just juts out to the east yeah, yeah. well it means the sun rises sooner for us fred yes and then I, I guess bigger picture, I talked to Natalie on, on the phone yesterday. The bigger picture is from the house side, the district, uh, the second Berkshire district um, is no longer. Um, and a house seat is, I, she was thinking that a house seat was added somewhere in the Boston metro area. And that's based on, on population loss and in populate, population loss in the western part of the state and population gain in the eastern part of the state. The, the biggest population bump was it was actually in the central part of the state, I believe. You know, 495 to, to Worcester kind of thing, I believe. Um, but I could be wrong about that. Um, our, so Waitley is now in the same house district as Greenfield. Is that accurate? That's my guess. I haven't looked at the map again, but. Is it, and we're talking state house, not U.S. Yeah. house. Yeah, that, the, the, the congressional maps have not been drawn yet yeah. or final. Oh. I, I haven't seen anything about the congressional maps. I'd be shocked if we didn't get shifted to the West in that. I would be out, too. out, out of what is now McGovern's district. I, I, I would I would be I would concur with that. Are you looking something up, Brian? You look very pensive. Yeah, my map's not loading. Um, in, in terms of the new house, one of the, one of the gripes from 
Deerfield was that they're being split in terms the of house. Of being split? Yeah. Wowza. So the first Franklin district, it Waitley remains in that. Um, and it takes a small portion of Greenfield. And then Greenfield is, is you know, the remaining portions of Greenfield are included in with the district with Irving, Orange, and Athol. Wait, but I thought you said that Deerfield was 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 grabbing because they'd been split. This isn't split. I think he meant Greenfield. Uh, green, sorry, Greenfield. Greenfield. Yeah. Yep. Greenfield was split. Wow. Oh, and we're that's interesting. We're we yeah, that's actually that stays the same. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um, so uh, uh, these were released yesterday. Um, I'm trying to find a date when comments are due. I think it's the 18th, but that sounds like it's too soon. No, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, committee will accept public comment on the House districts until 5 p.m. on October 18th. Yeah. Um, so that means we unless we schedule a special meeting to discuss this, this is not something that the board would discuss. No, it's each board at member, another time. Each board member is more than welcome to present their personal positions, but not speak on behalf of the board. They can, they can say that they're a select board member, but they're not speaking on behalf of the board. So, okay, cool. Anything else? I, 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 by the way, I did. I don't think you mentioned this. Maybe I, I apologize if, if you if you did. Um, Christian Lane at um, the Mill River is now a single lane road. Yep. That happened today, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think they did it yesterday afternoon. It was yesterday. Okay. Yeah, I went by there yesterday. Okay. Yep. And that's a good reminder. I'll I need to submit that letter to Mass DOT. Okay. All right. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Joyce. Aye. Fred. Aye. Me, yes. Have a great Aye. night, everybody.